All right, fantastic. So my name is Serena Yang. I am a sophomore student undergrad majoring in information science at Cornell University. This presentation is a product of work between me and my collaborator, Wei Ting, who unfortunately can't make it today. Our work is on using a data-driven approach for cyber risk and threat assessment. So what is cyber risk and threat assessment? There's a lot of definitions, but we're going to define risk assessment as understanding the damage attacks can do. And threat assessment is about understanding what attacks a system may be susceptible to. And these two go hand in hand for the goal of protecting our systems through prevention and preparedness. So one of the many methodologies for risk and threat assessment is using data-driven analysis, looking at data sets of network traffic, for example, to characterize attack behaviors and types. Once we know which features to analyze, we can look for patterns in attack behavior. If we understand the signs to look for, it can help us predict when and where attacks may happen. And in, particularly, in particular, we focus mostly on analysis between continent and country first time and provider for the data set we work with. So before I get into explaining some of the analysis and findings we had, let's first go over some background information because that information affected how we saw approached and interpreted the data. So first of all, a huge thanks to Stinger for providing data and allowing us to use the data that they had in today's presentation. For some context, Stinger is a community of honey nut honeypot projects that basically collect data to summarize attack events. Basically, we've been looking at a data set of attack event summaries. And I previously mentioned that we mostly focus on analyzing continent, country, first time, and provider data. But what do those terms mean? So let's go over some of the terminology first so that we're all on the same page. So first is continent and country. These refer to where the attack is coming from. So if I say that the country is United States, that means that the attack IP and ASN are coming from the US. Um, providers are the ones that are being attacked. In the data set that we worked with, there were a total of 33 different providers, each assigned a number. And finally, first time refers to the first time these honeypots identified an attack with a unique provider, ASN country, and etc. So now that I've covered the terminology I'm going to use, I'm going to actually start talking about what we did. So first, we just tried to get a very general broad scope of what our data set looked like. This is the attack distribution by continent for the Stinger data set. What we're seeing from this is that the volume of attacks coming from each region, um, and most of the attacks are coming from Asia. So the next thing we did was narrow down and get more specific with the attack volume distribution. We wanted to know if Asia had the most attacks because it was the specific provider, or if it was because Asia genuinely attacked the most all around or something else. And as you can see, Asia has the largest number of attacks for each provider. That means for each partner, they can genuinely expect a significant chunk of their attacks to be originating from Asia. But just because this plot shows that each provider is getting a lot of attacks from Asia overall, doesn't mean they're constantly being attacked from that continent. Remember, this data set comes from the accumulation of attack data over a period of time, in this case, over the span of two or three years. So we have to consider and analyze the data with that in mind. So that eventually led us to these plots. One of the features that we focused on was attack origin, location, and provider behavior across time. Specifically, each plot shows a country's attacks over time on all the providers. So these four, China, US, Russia, and Brazil, are the four countries where most of the attacks are coming from. And here is where the more interesting observations come in. Even though the attack frequency and distribution is different for each provider, we can see that all four countries have pretty similar distributions within each provider. So if the United States and China are attacking partner 28 a lot, let's say from the end of 2020 to mid 2021, you can see that Russia and Brazil are also attacking that provider more frequently in that time frame. But there are also exceptions to this pattern, especially with some providers that don't have as much data. To be able to see this better, we need to be able to see multiple countries at once. So let's look at this from a different perspective and let's concentrate on individual partners and who they're getting attacked by over time. So with provider 17, the top plot, you can see that they're getting a lot of attacks among the top 10 countries. The distribution is pretty similar, but in comparison for provider 22, someone who does not have as many attacks, the distribution similarity is kind of hard to tell. But three and three of the top 10 countries are missing. So Russia, India, and Vietnam did not have any attacks directed towards provider 22 that we know of. And this is generally the trend when we look at behavior for each provider. Providers with a lot of attack data generally have very similar distributions and behaviors between countries, specifically the top 10. And the outliers who often go against common trends of behaviors tend to be those that don't provide as much attack data. So we're now gonna switch gears a little 
As you can tell from the previous visualizations, it's pretty hard to tell if there are any specific patterns. For example, maybe the US often goes to provider five, then seven after attacking three. And to find these patterns, if they exist, would be really useful. So that means we need to understand how the distribution of data by volume might look like first. So here we can see the distribution of attacks from different countries based on the time of day. For the US, we can see a lot of these attacks are coming at 5 a.m. for some reason. And with China, it doesn't seem like any particular time sticks out. And with Russia, we can see that there are a few spikes. This data would be really useful if it turns out that the behavior is mirrored for individual partners. However, this data did not actually end up being particularly insightful because I later talked to Stinger and apparently the first time data used providers local time, not a universal time standard. But even with that, the distribution still ends up being mirrored in a lot of cases for individual partners that might be in different time zones, which is pretty interesting. So let's look at the plots on the right. These are plots of providers by time of day for the US only. So with provider 10 and 25, perfect. They seem to have a similar distribution to the overall one, but with 23 and 19, the distributions don't seem that similar to the overall distribution. And this is a continuation of a trend I mentioned earlier. Partner 10 and 25 have a lot of reports of attacks, but 23 and 19 don't have as many. So now that we've done this analysis, there are still quite a few limitations to the approach. The first is that the data sets are records of what's already happened. And given how quickly attack behavior can change, that means they're inherently outdated. Plus, even though we're working with the data set, that doesn't necessarily mean that the data is good. So we can take a look at this timeline for a provider, and you can see that there's a gap. And is that because no one attacked them at the time, or did the provider just stop reporting data? And so that brings us to future directions to potentially explore. Only looking at visualizations without a significant amount of quantitative analysis to verify our observations has lots of limitations. We can only see so much, so using pattern mining techniques may lead us to identify more patterns. There's also information that we didn't have that could have been very valuable in how we interpret the data. For example, the data we got did not have attack labels, so there's no way of knowing what kinds of attacks we analyzed. And the data we gathered only used two different sensor types, so we can, only, we can assume that the scope of attack types is also fairly narrow. This brings us back to the issue of data quality and applicability of this work. We want more quantitative analysis to back up our findings and methods but how valid can the results really be if we can't apply it to other data and situations? All of the work and results validity relies on the assumption that the data is accurate and is a good representation of attack behaviors, but that's a very dangerous assumption. Maybe the data we're given has something missing, like a sudden gap in reporting, and we need to have ways to measure and define data quality first. And we also need to see if it's possible to apply our observations to many different situations of data. Okay, so I would like to take a moment to thank Stinger again for providing us the data to work with. I would also like to thank Wei Ting um, for working on this with me, although she's not here today. And I would also like to thank Dr. Yang for all his guidance through the Cyber VSR program and providing such an amazing opportunity for me to learn. And I would also like to thank everyone at the Northeast Big Data Hub for making this event possible. And lastly, thank you to the audience for listening to our work today. Thank you.